In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Today's gospel reading comes right after the feeding of the 5,000. Jesus has been surrounded by crowds. He has healed them and fed them, and he is now exhausted. Jesus needs time to pray, recenter, recharge. So he makes or compels the disciples to get in the boat and go on over to the other side. He dismisses the crowds, and he goes up on the mountain alone to pray. Now in the meantime, as Deacon Bob read, a storm comes up, and the boat carrying the disciples is battered by the winds and the waves. In the morning, the disciples see Jesus coming toward them on the water, and they are terrified. But Jesus calls out to them. And then Peter says, Lord, if it's you, command me to come to you on the water. Jesus tells Peter to come, and Peter steps out on the water. But then we all know how the story goes. Peter's attention shifts to the wild winds stirring all around him instead of the waiting arms of Jesus. Peter gets scared and begins to sink, and Jesus catches him. You of little faith, why did you doubt? When the two of them get into the boat, the winds and the sea become calm. Why did Peter lose faith in today's reading? After all, he's experienced something similar before. Just six chapters earlier in the Gospel of Matthew, the disciples are stuck in a boat in the middle of the sea in a severe windstorm, and Jesus is sleeping. The disciples wake him up saying, Teacher, do you not even care that we're perishing? Jesus gets up, stills the storm with a mere verbal command, and then scolds the disciples. Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And now, just a few chapters later, in, in almost the exact same situation, Peter is no better at trusting Jesus. Throughout Matthew, Jesus has been showing the disciples who he is. But when Peter's back is up against the wall, Peter is once more overwhelmed by fear. Now, frankly, I think fear gets a bad rap. We often hear that fear is the opposite of love, as if we just loved more, then we'd fear less. And I don't really believe that's true. Because fear is the recognition that in a broken world, the things and the people we love can be very fragile. Fear is the recognition that losses do happen, that storms are real. The problem comes when fear overwhelms our trust in God. Sometimes when this happens, it's because we are deep down atheists. Now, it may be shocking to hear, but sometimes I'm an atheist. It's not that I don't believe in God. I do. In fact, I recite the creed several times a week and never with my fingers crossed behind my back. But the truth is that I am at times what Parker Palmer would call a functional atheist. He describes functional atheism as the unconscious unexamined conviction that if anything decent is going to happen here, we are the ones who must make it happen. A conviction held, he said, even by people who talk a good game about God. We functional atheists can know all the stories in scripture about how God rescues the disciples from storms, heals those who can just touch a micro inch of his garment, and makes two fish and five small loaves of bread stretch to feed 5,000 people. We can know all those stories. But no sooner have we asked God for help ourselves before we begin to worry about all the things we have to do, about the responsibilities that are ours alone to bear, about how things will only get done if we do them ourselves. No sooner have we prayed for God's presence and God's guidance, then we forget that there's any other game in town but ours. We forget that Jesus is in the storm with us. 
ready to scoop us up if we start to sink. I suspect that many of us may be atheists in that sense of the word. Maybe we all have a little functional atheism in us. Maybe it's because we've seen so much brokenness in the world. Maybe we're not even sure that God has the power to make a difference. After all, what sense can we make of all the mass shootings in our country? Or the racism that results in the needless loss of so many young people of color? People who have their whole lives ahead of them? Or a cancer diagnosis for someone we love? Or progressive dementia, extreme poverty, personal griefs too painful to name? We live in the midst of so many violent storms. And unlike in today's gospel story, Jesus doesn't often seem to rescue us by scooping us into a boat and calming the wind in an instant. Have we ultimately just come to doubt God's abilities to quiet these storms? To doubt God's ability to heal us? A couple of years ago, Jane Marshuski's audition on the TV show, America's Got Talent. Yes, that's what I do to wind down. <laughs> a couple of years ago, her audition went viral. She was a 30-year-old singer who went by the name Nightbird. You can look up her audition on YouTube. When she auditioned for the show, she had metastatic cancer with only a 2% chance of survival. Not long before she died, I came across one of her blog entries in which she wrote about her understanding of how God works. She wrote this. She wrote, I haven't come as far as I'd like in understanding the things that have happened this year, but there's one thing I do know. When it comes to pain, God isn't often in the business of taking it away. Instead, he adds to it. He is more of a giver than a taker. He doesn't take away my darkness. He adds light. He doesn't spare me of thirst. He brings water. He doesn't cure my loneliness. He comes near. So why do we believe that when we are in pain, it must mean that God is far? God is more of a giver than a taker. I've thought about that sentence so often. So often we live as functional atheists, thinking that we are all we've got, simply because we haven't had the experience of God taking away all the storms in our lives with a simple command or in a single instant. Maybe we forget that God heals us sometimes simply by being in the storm with us by adding to our lives the strength and the peace and the light and the hope and the assurance that we need to truly live even in the midst of the storms that surround us. As Richard Rohr has said, salvation in the Bible is not evil or sin or pain avoided. Salvation in the Bible is not evil or sin or pain avoided. It is evil and sin and pain transformed. So I invite you to reflect this morning on the ways that God has acted in the storms of your life. Perhaps by dramatic, dramatically quelling the storm with like a word or with an action, but probably much more often by simply being with you in the storm, by lifting you up, by working from the inside out. That quiet way of working in our lives is no less a miracle. If only we have eyes to see and hearts to fill.